Um, I just want to uh, uh, apologize that maybe the first half, uh, I may not be going into the Bible as much as we probably should because I have to lay a little bit of groundwork. So please um, be patient. But we will get to how that relates to Scripture later on. Um, I also wanted to point out that I'm not here to disprove particular theories and arguments. I mean, this is not really the place to do that. Um, I, I just I may inadvertently um, point out some things, uh, some flaws and different things people believe uh, just in order to show you that there is a story, uh, another side of the story that, um, um, that uh, it, to kind of sh- highlight why it's dangerous to just accept what people tell you um, at face value. I'm also not here to condemn anybody. Um, uh, there are uh, p- many of the people I know that delve into, that forward me uh, urban legends, for example, um, or uh, forward me st- uh, links to websites with questionable uh, material. Um, I mean, sometimes they're very godly and people a lot smarter than I am. I mean, they, um, it, you know, just because you get involved in things like that does not make you a stupid person at all. Um, it's uh, uh, so I'm not here to, I don't know many of you very deeply. I've only been here five years. Uh, so most of my um, experience that I'm sharing deals with um, my experiences in past churches I've been to. Uh, so I, if, if, again, if somebody feels like I'm stepping on your toes, it was not directed towards you. I don't probably know, you know, what you do in your private life. Um, and uh, the third point I want to make here is that uh, I'm not here to say all conspiracies are false because that's certainly not true. Uh, I mean, you take just for example the Watergate affair. Uh, that's not a conspiracy theory. That's a conspiracy fact. I mean, it's has it was a theory at one point and it's now been proven. The parties have admitted to what they did. So I, I recognize that there are dark forces at work in the world and. Um, and so I'm not here to just say that we should all stick our head in the sand and say that none of this is true. Um, so I'm not at all trying to, to s- make that point. Um, so before we get started, though, I just wanted to um, say a word of prayer, if you can all bow your heads. Heavenly Father, um, I pray that you, uh, that you might anoint my lips to speak today. Uh, Lord, I am not a professional pastor, but you, uh, when... You asked Moses to speak to the people. He said that he was a man of faltering lips. um, And he said, please send somebody else. But I know that you can, um, if you can speak through Moses, you can speak through me. And I pray that you might guide us uh, to uh, to a truth, to uh, what it is that you want to uh, reveal to your people today. Um, And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the year was 1994. Um, I was actually a Lutheran Sunday school teacher at that time, and I was also a youth leader uh, for high school age uh, students. And uh, we had a particular event we were doing up in Rochester, Michigan, when uh, one of my friends, who was another Sunday school teacher, gave me a pamphlet. And he says, hey, why don't you read this? And I looked through it. He told me that he had found it in a... um, gun and knife show, they were just handing them out. And so I went and started reading through it, and it was uh, talking about an agency which I had never heard of up until that point called FEMA, the, what, Federal Emergency Management Agency, I think. I, I suppose I should have looked up what the acronym meant before I got up here, but. Um, but it discussed FEMA and how FEMA was overstretching the, the uh, uh, boundaries of what they were legally allowed to do they were uh, allegedly establishing their own police force, their own spy network. Uh, there were uh, allegedly contingency plans to uh, set up camps where someday they were going to declare martial law and put all Americans in these camps. And uh, they had also talked a little bit about Mount Weather. I don't know if anybody here knows what Mount Weather is, but. Um, this was especially important during the Cold War that uh, Mount Weather is an installation that was dug into uh, solid rock um, and this installation has the ability to um, house a number of people for months on end with enough food, fresh water, electricity generation, um, all of that. There's meeting rooms, bedrooms. All of this has been dug into uh, 
into solid rock in a mountain, and that is where the President of the United States and his advisors will be whisked away to if there were ever nuclear war. Mount Weather can actually withstand the impact of a nuclear bomb. Um, and so somehow the author of this document was tying FEMA in with Mount Weather and saying that the two are somehow interrelated. Well, you can imagine that uh, my 23-year-old mind was just uh, alive with all this new information that was being presented to me that had been never shared with me before. I felt like I was on the verge of uncovering something really big, and I couldn't believe it and that nobody else knew about this. And indeed, my friend said to me, it's pretty scary stuff, isn't it? I said, absolutely. So it was interesting. One of the uh, points in the article was that the, um, uh, the author had actually called, it must have been the front desk of Mount Weather, and was asking the sergeant their pointed questions about the installation's purpose. And the sergeant's response was, no comment. But rather than me interpreting no comment from that sergeant as the words of a uh, probably grumpy mid-30s sergeant who was uh, working in a mundane job and was getting tired of people asking him questions that he perceived to be um, uh, silly. Um, I took the no comment to mean that he's hiding something, as many of us do. When we, when we listen to the news and a reporter comes up to somebody and uh, the person says no comment, I mean, we all automatically think, well, the guy must be guilty. He must be hiding something. After a while, I, I did share this with my dad. He didn't seem very interested in it. And uh, I uh, decided, well, I'm going to find out if there's any truth to this. So, uh, of course, this is 1994. It had only been recent that Al Gore had invented the Internet. So I couldn't really Google it. So I ended up going to the uh, library on campus and trying to dig through microfiche and magazines to find out anything I could on FEMA and Mount Weather. And I really didn't find much of anything, unfortunately. So as the years went by, I kind of forgot about all that. Um, I became baptized in 1996 uh, into this Seventh-day Adventist church. And um, as the years have gone by since then, I've been um, kind of alarmed at the extent that, the, um, that fellow church members uh, get involved in all these unproven theories. Um, and email forwards, I have a dear friend back in Michigan that sends me Anything that comes across his desk without vetting any of the information, you know, you name it. Um, um, hypodermic needles are inside of pay phones. Don't ever check the coin slot. And, you know, I get this stuff all the time, and it's never vetted in any way. And, um, it, and the reason I felt um, compelled to speak about this today is because it doesn't seem to ever get talked about. It's like the dirty secret of our church that... Um, that there's always, in every single Adventist church in the United States, there's always some people that really get into that stuff, and it kind of goes unchecked. Um, and if you're a visitor here, by the way, and if, if this is your first time worshiping with an Adventist church, um, don't worry, this is probably going on in your church too. This was a Lutheran church, as I said, that I first uh, got involved into this stuff. So uh, don't walk away here saying that we're a bunch of crazy people or something. But first of all, I wanted to uh, establish what an urban legend is. Uh, the definition of it is an, a, um, a story that's involving incidents of the recent past. It often um, includes humor and horror. Um, it spreads quickly, and uh, it's popularly believed to be true. Um, I think we've all run into them. I'll give a couple examples. Um, the idea that Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, why it is that they changed their name to KFC. Has anyone ever had anyone send you an email on that? Like, oh my gosh, don't eat Kentucky Fried Chicken. The reason they uh, changed their name to KFC is because the U.S. government told them that they're not allowed to sell it anymore as chicken because they're actually genetically mutated birds um, that no longer resemble chicken. They have no feathers or beaks, and so legally they can't call themselves Kentucky Fried Chicken anymore. Um, this thing has been circulating for years now. Um, and here, and, and just so you know, I'm, I'm not just preaching to you guys, I'm preaching to myself, because last night, in my notes, I almost gave you a subsequent urban legend that I, I just now, last night, at 10 at night, discovered was not true. The thing that I, the other urban legend to that was that the state of Kentucky uh, trademarked the name Kentucky in order to uh, increase their, their state revenue. So any company using the word Kentucky would have to pay um, uh, a fee to the state of Kentucky. That's not true either. The reason, the real reason is that they simply 
Um, don't want everyone to always be reminded of the fact that their food is fried and they were trying to have a more varied menu, more than just chicken. So by just calling themselves KFC, it kind of downplays the fried chicken and allows them to sell other things. So the truth is not that, not nearly as exciting. Uh, the second one, uh, second example, I don't know, anyone ever hear the story about Ozzy Osbourne? He was supposedly a disgruntled Seventh-day Adventist that had gone to Andrews. Totally not true. I, I worked um, and did some digging on that. Um, Ozzy Osbourne was already heavy into the music scene before he even came to the United States. He was never a Seventh-day Adventist. And the reason that his band is called Black Sabbath has nothing to do with thumbing their nose at his for alleged former church. It's, it was a movie reference. There was a movie that he really liked, and, and somehow Black Sabbath was something in that movie, and he was making reference to that. Um, so I think, you know, I, I could be up here for, for an hour sharing, you know, many examples of urban legends, but I think you guys all know what they are, and, um, and we don't really have to go through any more. Um, the other thing we're going to talk about is conspiracy theory. That's a theory that seeks to explain a disputed case or matter or a plot by a group or an alliance rather than an individual or isolated act. So it's really got two parts. It's a conspiracy that there's more than one party involved. It wasn't just a random event that happened, that there was actual coordination between multiple parties to do whatever it is that happened. And it's a theory. It doesn't mean it's false. It doesn't mean it's true. It's a theory at this point. Um, it could be true, but we don't have enough information to prove it beyond a doubt. Um, just as evolution is a theory. Nobody was alive uh, you know, that's here today, when the earth was created, nobody brought a camcorder with them and taped the event. So until we come up with something like that, um, it is going to be a theory and you can't prove it. Um, so that, it, sometimes I think the word conspiracy theory has taken on a negative connotation, but if you really break down the, the definition, it's not anything evil, it's, it's a theory that's about a particular conspiracy that may or may not have happened. Um, here are some examples of conspiracy theories. Um, this idea that the Holocaust never happened. That's a very popular theory lately in the Middle East um, to kind of downplay the sufferings of the Jews um, in, in Israel. Um, there is the theory that the Boston Marathon bombing was carried out by Navy SEALs and it was an inside job and it had nothing to do with the two young men that were arrested. Um, there's third one, guillotines. Um, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is maybe one that pops up in the Adventist church from time to time. This, um, this notion that Japan is manufacturing thousands of guillotines that the U.S. government is going to be importing um, to cut off the heads of Seventh-day Adventists. I mean, it sounds crazy, but this, that was actually something that somebody preached from the pulpit in Chicago. Um, my friends were horrified that, that this pastor was preaching such nonsense. But those are some examples of conspiracy theories. Um, and I just want to go over a few common characteristics of them. Uh, number one, with conspiracy theories, usually information is left out that helps you to, uh, that uh, would completely change how you viewed the facts. Um, sometimes the facts are presented to you in a pretty compelling way, but what you might find out is that if you were just, if you just had that one last piece of information, it would make everything else uh, appear completely different. Um, has anyone seen Fahrenheit 9-11? Um, if you haven't seen it, you probably have uh, at least heard about it. Uh, but it was a documentary film by Mr. Michael Moore, who is himself heavily into conspiracy theories, uh, very left-wing uh, politically. And he, he created this documentary about what really happened during um, the events of 9-11. Uh, in this movie, um, it, it, many of you might recall that immediately following the 9-11 um, attacks, that all the planes in the United States were grounded. Um, none of the, um, uh, nobody was allowed to fly unless it was special permission. There were some very special exceptions. And in the movie, it is, uh, um, they allege that um, George W. Bush gave special permission to uh, bin Laden's family to, fl um, to fly out that uh, they knew that bin Laden had some uh, family members who were allegedly not terrorists, they were businessmen, and they were living in the U.S., and because they felt that they were in danger being here after these attacks, they were given special permission by George W. Bush to fly out of the country. That actually is true. However, 
<coughs> the part that was left out in the movie is that the permission was given during that no-fly period, but they were not allowed to fly until everyone else was. So people were watching this movie very angry, thinking, I can't believe it. We were US citizens, and we were denied the ability to go visit family in other cities and states, and yet the Bin Ladens had permission to fly, for, uh, special permission from the president. Well, no, he had, they had special permission to fly out, and they were put in a staging position to fly out once the flights resumed. And you say, wow, that, that changes the whole way I look at that. You know, the information was accurate that Michael Moore had presented, but he purposely, and I, I'm pretty sure it was on purpose, left out this key detail that completely changes the way you view the facts. And I, and I find that time and time again, when you, when you see, um, when somebody sends you an email forward about something uh, that's a, about a conspiracy, the facts are often true, um, but there's often key pieces of information that are missing that would help you to evaluate those facts accurately. Um, the second point that's uh, very typical of a conspiracy theory is that the facts are assumed to prove the theory that has already been accepted. That the people uh, who indulge in these occasionally uh, are so, um, have embraced that theory so strongly that it doesn't matter what facts you present at this point because they will all prove the theory anyways. Um, a perfect example of that. This is a scene from the Boston bombing. This was taken right off of, I don't know, Infowars or one of these conspiracy websites. And it says, more Navy SEAL contractors? Are they rendering aid? And what's in their backpacks? So the friend of mine back home, a dear, a dear godly man in my church back in Michigan, um, forwarded me that for the first time. And um, um, actually, indeed, I was waiting for it because after the bombings happened, I told my friend, I wonder how long before somebody says it's an inside job. And it only took like about a week. Um, but I got this email, and uh, I, I, wrote, I wrote back to him, and I said, um, okay, these are Navy SEALs. These are our best troops. These are the, the, the cream of the crop. If they were that smart, why would they wear combat boots and flak vests to make themselves more conspicuous? And his answer was, they were real Navy SEALs because everyone knows the real Navy SEALs would be, t would be too smart to wear uh, combat boots, so these guys deliberately wore combat boots so you would think that they were not real Navy SEALs. <laughs> and he said, ha. He really did. He said, ha. So... Right then and there, I realized it doesn't matter what facts you present to this man. If they're wearing combat boots, it's because they're Navy SEALs. If they're wearing civilian clothes, they're still Navy SEALs. He's already assumed his theory to be true, and every piece of information that comes across his desk is only confirming that which he already believes. The, um, the next point to make here, um, and this is a bit wordy, um, the, the, the last... Con uh, um, characteristic I want to share with you is this idea that um, the explanations for conflicting information uh, becomes more far-fetched in order to maintain the accepted theory, and it assumes unprecedented ability for the government or conspiring organization to execute their plans competently while maintaining secrecy. Um, what you see there is the remains of United Airlines Flight 93. It crashed into a field near the Diamond Team Mine in uh, Stony Creek Township, Pennsylvania. Um, during the 9-11 attacks, they, uh, the passengers aboard the plane tried to overpower the terrorists that had taken charge of it, and it crashed into the middle of this field. Well, I have another friend who is a, another dear brother in Christ who was showing me photos of the crash site and pointing out that there was no visible plane pieces and then the, uh, the plane, uh, the crash site was then um, taped off and the press was not allowed in. And then, lo and behold, pieces of a plane started getting extracted from the hole in the ground. And so he, his theory was that the CIA set a bomb off in the middle of a field when nobody was looking in that direction. And then the government smuggled pieces of the plane into that area to pretend that they were taking it out. Um, I mean, some of you are laughing at this, but this is a very, you would be surprised by how many people hold on to this. Sometimes that when you have closed doors and nobody around, people start sharing things that you never realized that they all um, believed. And it's very common in our church. I mean, church as a whole, I don't mean this one. Um, so 
my point again was that uh, that we are you are already uh, you're assuming that the government is capable of some amazing feats. Um, so I said to him, um, "Look, I hear what you're saying, but what you're what you're telling me is that the government." set off a bomb in the middle of an area without anyone seeing them do it. Uh, then they smuggled pieces of an aircraft in. Then they had to get the buy-in from United Airlines to take a plane out of service and remove it from their books. They had to <clears throat> arrest and put in jail offshore somewhere the passengers of that plane, is what he's saying, because these people are missing and their loved ones surely know they're not around. Um, and I said, they did all of this without getting caught. I said, if, these, if the government was that smart, if they were so smart, why wouldn't they just get some CIA agents to dress up as terrorists and go take down a real plane? Wouldn't that be far easier? I mean, you wouldn't have to do all this, this uh, hocus pocus stuff. You just go in and crash a plane. Uh, and he said, I know what you're saying, but look at the facts. I, it, it sounds weird, but th you can't see the plane in the picture. It's like, okay. Um, I think that... I find it hard to believe that the federal government, who is for seven months now, can't send my brother-in-law his green card correctly, is somehow able to pull off these amazing stunts without getting caught. I don't know how many have ever worked with the government. Uh, I was in the army, and I can tell you we didn't always do things very competently. Um, so I don't know how the CIA would figure all that out. Um, the question is then, if there are these uh, drawbacks to it. Why are people drawn to conspiracy theories? Well, number one is it makes sense out of a confusing world. Um, there are always gaps in our knowledge and things we don't understand. Um, even in the Bible, I mean, there's things in the Bible I don't understand. Um, that's where faith comes in. I just trust that God is going to someday show me or maybe when I get to heaven, explain to me why it is that something might appear to be in conflict. Um, the people that struggle the most are those that can't accept the uh, gaps and that feel like they need a way to explain everything. Um, second of all, it divides the world into light and darkness. Um, it's hard to accept the fact that good people sometimes do bad things. Bad people occasionally are capable of doing acts of kindness. Um, it's sometimes easier just to divide the world into two groups and just say the conspiracy th uh, people and then there's us, the innocent victims. Um, and the third point that draws people to such theories is that it gives the reader a sense of importance. I was going to read this from publiceye.org uh, where somebody worded it best. Conspiracy theories are often presented as special secret knowledge unknown or unappreciated by others. For conspiracy theorists, the masses are a brainwashed herd while the theorists in the know can congratulate themselves on penetrating the plotter's deceptions. And I, I, I'll admit, I felt the same way when I, um, you know, started learning about FEMA. I felt like I was on to something that nobody else knew about, and there's a thrill in that. Um, what is the harm, though? Some people might say, ah, oh, you know, I, I, you know I, I still read my Bible and everything. This is just something I study on the side. I don't share it with new believers. What's the harm in what I'm doing? Um, well, first of all, it destroys the reputations of people, organizations, and corporations. Um, if we can just turn to Exodus 2016, it should be up on the screen too, but if you want to turn in the Bible to Exodus 2016, and you probably should be because the whole point of this message is to not trust what people are telling you unless you check it for yourself, and um, I could be misleading you up on the screen. Exodus 20:16, it reads, "You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, except for if it's George Bush, right? Is that what you guys all have? No, it says, "Do not give false testimony against your neighbor." It doesn't really matter who it is. Your neighbor could literally be your neighbor, but it could be Lady Gaga. And, you know, though it might not seem as um, meaningful if you're forwarding an, an email about something that Lady Gaga allegedly did, um, in the end, she's still a human being and you're still gossiping about her or possibly sending false information. Um, it doesn't matter if they're a public figure such as our president. It's, if, it, if it might not be true, then maybe you shouldn't be forwarding it. Uh, and I say this preaching myself, too. I've been guilty of gossip and forwarding things um, as I said a little bit ago, I, had, uh, I had, was still 
telling people the wrong information on the KFC story, thinking that Kentucky really had trademarked their name. Um, keep in mind that you think that if it's a corporation, it's harmless, but Procter & Gamble has spent millions in lawsuits and trying to correct their reputation because for 20, 30 years now, people have been saying that um, a percentage of Procter & Gamble's profits have been going to the Church of Satan. Um, the email keeps forwarding. First, it was Donahue. Then they changed the name of the talk show host as the email kept going through the Internet over the years. But... Um, it's not true, it never happened, and Procter & Gamble has actually won multiple lawsuits against people spreading that gossip. Um, and you say it's harmless, but um, you know the corporation doesn't have hurt feelings, but you know what? There's employees of these companies that might have been expecting a bonus check that may not get as much because um, the company didn't have the money because it was tied up in clearing their name. So there is harm. The uh, next point here is uh, gossip is gossip, even if it's about a famous person, church, or organization. We kind of touched on that. If we can turn to Romans 1, 29 through 30. And I purposely didn't mark it in my book but put it so that I would give you guys time to find it too. Uh, 129 says they have become filled. Okay, hold on. And I also have signed up for a vision plan for this January too. Um, they become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. So he's condemning um, people who gossip and slander. Um, he's putting them in the same level as people that hate God. Um, this is NIV I'm reading from, and by the way, there is a conspiracy that the uh, NIV was, um, uh, I think, was translated wrong on purpose either by Satan himself or I think they say the Jesuits might be involved. That's another theory. Um, I don't believe it's true. Uh, I think the NIV has its ups and downs just like any other translation. But um, So as we see, gossip is gossip. It doesn't matter who it is. Um, it doesn't matter if they're famous or if they're... Um, uh, public figure, it's still wrong to spread. Um, this, uh, the next item, what, uh, under what is the harm, people not take us seriously when we have true information to share. Um, as I told you before, some of the people who I've, uh, w um, who I've gone to church with who have shared different um, unproven theories with me, um, sometimes they're very smart people. There's one guy I had put him on such a high pedestal. I thought he was a really smart guy. He was very uh, godly man. Indeed, he is both of those things. But when he started sharing with me the, the um, idea he had that 9-11 didn't really happen, he claimed that planes never hit the buildings and that the video had been all doctored up and that um, I don't know what about the thousands of witnesses that saw it. I think he says that they're all being pressed to not um, come forward. Um, but I started to lose respect for him. I mean, uh, and I know he's not stupid, but that, I mean, I'll be honest, sometimes as a human being, when somebody um, says things like that, you think, how can you be that gullible? And unfortunately, that interferes with our ability to witness to uh, people later on. Um, because last time I checked, when I came in here on the front of this church, it said we are Seventh-day Adventists, and we believe in a true conspiracy, which is that Satan has hijacked religion. He has twisted doctrines in, in many churches to get people to believe some things that God never intended for us to believe, uh, whether it's the state of the dead, um, uh, whether it's worshiping on the right day. That is, that's a conspiracy, and I believe that conspiracy theory is true. And so when we start sharing with others conspiracies that may or may not be true, um, even if it's held in general uh, in, in the view of the public as to probably not be true, um, later on, if we try to witness to those people, they're not going to really listen to us. They're going to think, well, if this guy is gullible enough to fall for this other stuff, why should I listen to what he has to say here? Um, and the next item, is, as far as the harm goes, is over time, it can lead you to become more detached from reality. Um, there is a, a saying that's been said many times, it's been twisted over the years, when you believe in nothing, you'll fall for anything. That's actually uh, a twisting of the words of, uh, of the writer G.K. Chesterton. Um, 
after a while, if you don't accept that, um, uh, that the things that are being presented to you on Fox News and CNN and all these other things could possibly be true, um, you'll start falling for just about anything. Um, here's an example of this. I have a friend who is uh, um, uh, another dear church member back in Michigan who is really hardcore into conspiracy theories. And he, uh, to the point where you don't even want to be around him anymore, he's kind of alienated all of his friends um, because every time you're with him, he starts bringing up all the stuff. He tries to find a segue in your conversation to bring up some um, dark thing that's taking place behind closed doors. Um, the last time I went to see him, he, he actually took a $20 bill, folded it in this intricate pattern to show me that the World Trade Center is burning in the middle of that, um, that bill. And to which I said, well, so what? What are you trying to tell me? Are you trying to tell me that the, the artist for that bill years ago somehow knew prophetically that the building was going to burn? I mean, I don't even know where he was going with that. But you could see that after a while, you become more detached from reality as you get delving into these things, that some of the ideas you come up with are a little bit more ludicrous. Um, it's almost like when I was in high school, and I don't even know if I want to admit this, but I used to play Dungeons and Dragons, and the, after a while, like you get so into it that the only people that can relate to you are the other people that play Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, it, it was, I became kind of socially inept in a sense. Um, <laughs> So Matthew 7, 16 says, by their fruit you will recognize them. What is the fruit of an urban legend, uh, or, or excuse me, what is the fruit of delving into email forwards um, if it's going to result in things like that? If it can do that to several of my friends, what might it do to you um, if you delve into it too deeply? <clears throat> um, the last item, and this is probably the most important one, is it could cause you to lose your faith in God. I, you might be laughing and say, how on earth is getting involved in conspiracy theories going to um, ruin my faith in God? I got into this because it fits with what the Bible says, uh, is what many people will say. Well, think about it. If, if after a while you don't trust anything in the written word, if you don't, you, don't, you don't trust any of the news sites, you only go to the specific sites run by um, questionable individuals that give you your news, if you don't believe anything at face value, why should you even believe the Bible? You can go out on the web and you'll find plenty of material telling you that the Bible has um, is been twisted, that it's been translated wrong, um, that it's hiding. I have a, a family member that believes that it actually teaches reincarnation and that the whole Bible has been translated incorrectly by all the um, scholars that have done so. Um, I'm reminded when I was living in Michigan, we used to have a Starbucks ministry. <clears throat> we had a, a group of youth from uh, my church, and I led this group. And we had a program called Three Angels and a Cup of Decaf. And we would go to the Starbucks and, uh, and on every Tuesday and, and do Bible studies. And uh, we had kind of people that rotated in and out that were of other denominations. Um, I wish we had gotten more baptisms out of it than we did. We had one guy get baptized. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, we were able to share a lot of what our church believes with different people. Um, and during that time, there was a young man that uh, we met there. And uh, I, I got to know him a little bit because he, he would go there regularly to work on stuff. And this guy was a shoe-in for joining our church, or at least for our youth group. This guy was a GM engineer. Everybody in my youth group was an engineer. Um, this guy uh, was into road bicycles. He was into motorcycles, just like they all were. Every guy in my church, it seemed, had a, a um, sport bike. Um, the guy was into Formula One, and that's what all my buddies and I would do, is go watch Formula One races. I mean, you could not have picked a better um, a specimen of person to join um, our particular church because he fit right in perfectly. So I had high hopes that someday we might see him baptized into the church. Well, but I didn't count on one thing. This young man was heavily into conspiracy theories. As he would study the Bible with us in Starbucks, it seemed like he would question every point because he always felt there was an ulterior motive behind things. Um, in fact, I, uh, he was on my email list, he still is, and I had one time sent an email um, with an article that I was sharing with all my Christian friends, um, uh, and in fact, the article was highlighting that piece of pottery. 
Um, that piece of pottery is a shard of pottery that was dug up from a Philistine house um, that was being um, excavated in the area of what, Philistia or whatever, whatever country the Philistines come from. Um, and uh, that pottery says Goliath on it. Has anyone ever, everyone heard about that? Really? This is like seven years ago. This is old news. They, they dug up this piece of pottery and it's got Goliath's name on it. Um, and even, even the skeptical scholars begrudgingly agree that that's what it says. But I mean, now you cannot necessarily prove that that's the Goliath that owned that piece of pottery. There could have been more than one Goliath in, in that country. Nevertheless, that's pretty astounding news. The idea that Goliath was a name in circulation in, in that region um, during that time. So I sent that email to all my friends said, wow, look at that thing they just discovered. And that young man wrote me back and he said, I highly doubt that that is true. And he sent me two links to two uh, rinky-dink websites that somebody had set up. And uh, in those websites, it was claimed that um, the Bible has been fabricated, that uh, Israel never existed as a nation. They believe that there was a group of Jews living far east of that area who made up the whole story of the Bible, and they sent people to plant fake artifacts in the soil so that one day they would be able to go back and lay claim to that territory as their own. And I'm like, what is going through your mind? That's the most crazy thing I've ever heard in my life. But, but he believed it. And on, because somebody had wrote about it. If, it. if it exists on the internet, he pretty much embraced it, as long as it didn't come from CNN, Fox News, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so you could see that this young man may not be in heaven with us someday. And the reason why is because his mind has been taught over time to distrust everything that's presented to him, to where he doesn't know, he doesn't know what's what anymore. So you, there is a danger. Um, I just wanted to go over uh, also that the Bible warned us uh, Oh, that's right. There are people that will make the argument, but the Bible warned us about these events, and we just need to be uh, aware of these things. So that is often the argument that I hear, that um, you, can't, you, you can't be blind to this. This is exactly what the Bible predicted, and then they'll share with you these conspiracy theories. Um, well, if you can turn to Ephesians 5, 11 through 13, book of Ephesians, Um, chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. And it says, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed to light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes the light. All right, so if you were to read that, the first verse says, if, uh, don't get involved in the deeds of darkness, but expose them. So many a person in our church will say, I am exposing the deeds of darkness. So therefore, I'm being obedient to what God put in that verse. But then the next verse says, it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. So you say, okay, God, how am I supposed to do both of those things at the same time? You just told me to expose the dark deeds now you're telling me not to even mention what the disobedient do. Um, the answer to that is in the next verse. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. So what it's saying is the light is the, is the truth. It's God's word. That if you, if you get uh, to where you're reading your Bible and understanding and sharing with other people, reading your Bible is going to highlight those things that are evil and exposing those things that are evil and what's not. You do not have to embrace uh, questionable websites or email forwards or any of those things, at programs that somebody's handed you on a DVD at the back of the church. Um, the Bible should be sufficient. If you read your Bible, it's going to teach you what things to avoid and what things not to. It's going to expose dark things. And if, it, and if the Bible doesn't expose... Um, something in particular, then it's probably not something you need to worry too much about. Um, the next one is uh, 1 Timothy uh, 1, 3 through 4. If we can turn to that, 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 4.
It says here, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. So one of the items that, he's, that he speaks about are myths. Um, and he, his criticism of, of that is that it promotes controversy rather than God's work. So he wasn't, um, it w- it's interesting that he didn't condemn them for anything else but the fact that by indulging in myths that you are causing um, speculations and controversies that is interfering with God's work is what it's doing. It's not relevant, um, and, and by wasting your time on this, it's interfering with more important things. If we can then turn to Acts, uh, this was the s- scripture reading that uh, Joseph already had read, Acts 17, eight through tw- 18 through 21. And there were other verses I could have used as well there, um, in the interest of time. Um, I didn't. But you might be wondering where I was going with this. I'm not going to read it all over again, uh, but Acts 17, 18 through 21 was when Paul went to Athens to um, speak in front of all these Greek philosophers. And um, <clears throat> they were like, what is this strange teaching? You know, why don't you come here and, uh, and explain this to us? And um, it says in verse 21, uh, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. So they're, they're sitting there listening to all these theories that people were sharing with them from all these walks of life. And they're evaluating them and discussing them. Um, their minds were not being fruitful. They're just sitting around um, entertaining every idea that came along. Um, and we know that not very many people um, got baptized out of that, that sermon. Um, there were a few people that Paul was able to convince of the truth while he was in Athens. But a lot of people, their minds were so accustomed to, uh, so open to every idea that came along that they weren't really li- willing to listen to what he had to share. It was just another one of many odd theories that came uh, across their, their desktop. Um, then the uh, next one, if you can read Isaiah 8, 12 through 13. If we could turn to Isaiah 8. Uh, Isaiah 8, 12 through 13. says, do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. When we, when we um, worry about what these, um, what's going on with these secret societies and such, we're putting too much uh, stock in the ability of of what humans can do and not trusting in God we're spending too much time fearing things that we don't need to fear because if we trust God, these are things we don't need to worry about. The context of that, of that particular um, uh, statement was that Judah was being threatened by a conspiracy between Israel and Syria. And King Ahaz was afraid, and so he was going to turn to the Assyrians. And uh, God rebuked him. This was not a conspiracy theory. This was a conspiracy fact. There really was two nations conspiring to uh, attack Judah. Um, But nevertheless, God rebuked him because King Ahaz was putting uh, all his worries into what was going on politically and not trusting in God. That if he, God's the one you need to fear. He's the one that that can bring you down from your position from the throne and he's the one that can put you there. Um, and he's the one that can protect you uh, despite all the people conspiring against you. Now, I also wanted to talk about briefly what, what did our church founders have to say about this? Um, uh, you know, I realize that you know, that's not the Bible, but nevertheless, I think it would be interesting to ask like, what were some of the things that people um, talked about during the time that the Seventh-day Adventist Church first got started in the late 1800s. Uh, first of all, I think I, it's, it's interesting that there is no mention of Illuminati in any writings that I've found. Um, so 
uh, which is interesting because Illuminati did exist, and if it was important, um, somebody surely would have brought it up. Um, Freemasonry was also brought up, uh, was brought up, but only maybe half a dozen times or so, and it was usually in the t context of this. Let me read it to you. It says, um, this is from the book Selected Messages, chapter 13. Uh, so this would have been, what, late, I assume late 1800s. Uh, there are those who question whether it is right for Christians to belong to the Freemasons and other secret societies. <clears throat> um, in your connection with worldly societies, are you keeping your covenant with God? Do these associations tend to direct your own mind or that of others to God, or are they diverting the interest and attention from him? So notice that, uh, and this was uh, Ellen G. White that wrote this, notice that she wasn't concerned about um, the Freemasons being involved in controlling governments and things like that. Um, she didn't warn us of anything like that. She was concerned because people would be unequally yoked with unbelievers by joining a society of people that did not believe as you did. And she felt that that would um, um, impact your spiritual life. Um, so nothing said about conspiracies or anything like that. It was simply that the Freemasons did not believe as we did. Um, the next uh, quotation comes from the book Evangelism, page 173. It says, do not attack authorities. Our work is not to make a raid on the government, but to prepare a people to stand in the great day of the Lord. The fewer attacks we make on authorities and powers, the more work we will do for God. So it is not our job to uncover these things and to attack the government. Uh, and again, I'm just as guilty as other people. I probably grumble about what the government's doing uh, with this or that. But we really have to be careful because uh, that's not our job. Um, the next item that I found was um, from Evangelism page 180. Uh, does it say 180? It says 182. Well... I'll just read from there. It is the device of the enemy to divert men's minds to some obscure or unimportant point, something that is not fully revealed or is not essential to salvation. These things don't matter. I mean, even, even if it could be proven that some of the, um, uh, if it could be proven that Jesuits were behind the sinking of the Titanic, uh, that's another crazy thing that I read in some book uh, that says the Jesuits were behind the Titanic, behind Abe Lincoln's assassination, and... Um, a lot, of, a lot of unusual ideas. Even if that was true, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change your relationship with God. It shouldn't affect you at, at all. You need to be staying in God's word. This is, it's not a salvation issue, and it, it, it shouldn't be indulged in. Um, the next one is uh, from page 180 of evangelism. You should have a clear apprehension of the gospel. The religious life is not one of gloom and of sadness, but of peace and joy, coupled with Christ-like dignity and holy solemnity. We are not encouraged by our Savior to cherish doubts and fears and distressing forebodings. These bring no relief to the soul and should be rebuked rather than praised. And one of the forums I was in uh, it talked of a young man who left the church because all he ever heard his parents do is, is uh, worrying and, and uh, all of their concern about what the government was going to do to take away their rights and to imprison them. And he said, what kind of church is this? As he grew up, he says, I don't want to be part of this. This is all they ever talk about. Um, we should be joyous. We should be a joyous people. And how can you be joyous if you're always concerned about um, what's going to happen behind the scenes? <clears throat> um, the, the next one is, uh, was a letter to the General Conference on December 27, 1896. It says, Would we know how we may best please the Savior? It is not in engaging in political speeches, either in or out of the pulpit. It is in considering with fear and trembling every word we utter, where the people assemble to worship God, let not a word be spoken that shall divert the mind from the great central interest, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, um, let me tell you the context of that. Does anyone know who that is? Hopefully we don't have anyone here old enough to remember him. It's William Jennings Bryan. He was a Democratic presidential candidate um, in the late 1800s. And he was advocating so-called free silver I believe that all the money was gold-backed at that point, and he was advocating an expansion of the money supply. Um, allegedly, it was going to help farmers. 
Um, the, the letter I just read to you to the general conference was in reference to that controversy, that, there, that it was brought up because many members of the church were spending their time debating over whether this was a good policy or not. And what she said was that this was Satan's uh, um, uh, goal to get people distracted by things that, again, are not important to salvation. It should be noted that she herself did not agree with that policy and said it would be harmful. So the lesson we can get from that is it's okay to study the issues. It's okay to vote. Um, there's nothing wrong with voting and trying to pick godly leaders that will steer a country the right way. But what I found time and time again in some of the writings uh, that she had was that you, um, uh, you vote, but you don't need to go telling everybody who you voted for and try to convince people to do the same. Um, I, and again, I, I'm preaching to the preacher here. I am frequently guilty of that. But in the end, um, you know, if you don't like George W. Bush, that's fine. But don't call him an idiot because there's a Republican over there that you might need a witness to someday soon. Um, maybe you didn't, uh, didn't like uh, Obama, but don't go telling everybody that he's not a U.S. citizen because there's a Democrat over there that you might need to share the three angels' message with. That... Uh, it's okay to understand what poli what's going on, but we need to be careful not to go overboard and delving into that kind of thing. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this closing thought that's probably too small for many of you to read back there, so I'll just, but I'll read it out loud because I think this kind of um, highlights everything I was trying to say here. This was found in a, um, an Adventist forum, um, and it was a, uh, I kind of cleaned it up a little bit to make it shorter. But, and get to the point. It says, I have found that many people seem to think that the Bible legitimizes any conspiracy theory they wish to believe. The same goes for the book, The Great Controversy. Nothing is too far-fetched. Once it implicates Rome, it must be true. Black helicopters, the UN, Jesuits, Illuminati, Bilderbergers, Rockefellers, and on and on. It is truly disturbing how many of these people see this as a natural extension of the inspired writings, almost as if they were one and the same the level of trust put in them and of the willingness, eagerness to annex them to the Bible uncritically is inexcusable. This is not the gospel and it is not the revelation of Jesus Christ either. If you can all bow your heads, I just want to say a closing word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, um, thank, you for, uh, thank you for thank you for teaching us through the scriptures and, and through some of the writings of our forefathers that, um, that we are here to preach the name of Jesus Christ and that all these other things are secondary. Lord, please help us um, in our workplaces, and our homes, to be careful of what we share with people, um, especially when we're not sure if it's true, and to properly vet information coming to us. Lord, because this is a confusing world, Lord, the internet is a wonderful tool, but it's part of the thing that makes it so wonderful is the ability for anyone to have a voice, and not everybody's voice is equal in terms of uh, um, its truthfulness. Um, Lord, help us to steer around these obstacles. Um, help us to remain focused on that which is important, uh, which is um, our relationship with you. Um, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.